Hi. Okay, um, my name is Yet from the uh, from the Spring Hearts uh, Family Service Center, New York Community Services. I'm Elvin Go uh, from Methodist Welfare Services. So today we are here to talk about to share about enhancing practice through a learning organization. So then, what will be uh, the driving forces behind the transformation? Well, I mean, certainly, like I said, right, I just set down some of the reasons why we needed to change. Uh, at the same time, I think there was a recognition that uh, uh, what's happening in, you know, macro systems uh, was also impacting us, uh, changing social landscape. I mean, I think we've already said uh, enough of how families uh, are very complex and the situations and the pressures that they face are very multifaceted. Uh, as for, for us, um, look, casework is, is a non-negotiable, okay? but the, the thing is that moving forward, um, all, all the issues are getting more complex. Okay, So we, we need to be innovative and creative uh, in order to be able to reach out to, to the changing demographic and the complexity of the issues. So, so the need for service innovation is really, really important. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So this call for, for the whole organization to be yeah. To, to, to adopt this learning uh, uh, attitude. Yeah. Well, I'd like to say something about human capital challenges as well. I think uh, when it comes to staff retention, I think when we've, uh, I think people left also our organization prior to the uh, restructuring or reorganization is because they felt that they were not growing. Um, and uh, certain individuals get more uh, opportunities than others. So when it comes to talent, it, Later, we'll talk about it, 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 it kind of cascades into talent retention issues as well. But what we found was that uh, professionals wanted to do good work. The difficulty was that there was no way for them to know whether they are doing competent work. So uh, part of the restructuring uh, later as you will hear was uh, introduction of measures to, to actually help workers know where they are in terms of the kind of work that they're doing. Yeah, that's right. Okay, of course, uh, with transformation and change in place, we will face challenges uh, uh, on the ground. And uh, these are all real voices uh, from all levels of, uh, of uh, people. And uh, I think what really hit us uh, uh, deeply as, uh, in VCI is actually this point on the control of developing. Well, the, the good intent of uh, developing uh, the organization very often is misunderstood by the ground to be um, to be questioning us about control. They, qu they, they question about, hey, why are you starting to, to uh, in, impose so many uh, uh, SOP, why impose so much of the, uh, other, other stuff, standards of uh, practice and so on? Are you trying to track my uh, work? Are you, going to, are you trying to control my work? Sure, uh, the, yeah. the word there was micromanage. Micromanage. Mm. <laughs> so the restructuring actually culminated in the, the physical restructuring of the services in 2019, where, um, like I said earlier, our 19 centers and services were clustered into three uh, groups uh, family services, uh, community uh, elder care, and residential elder care. So basically, um, some of our residential homes, uh, senior activity centers. So that was actually part of the restructuring. And also, uh, as a result of that, our key appointments. Um, uh, of class directors, uh, of, uh, and I'm one of the class directors in charge of family services, um, and the director of professional standards. So, the first order of things, at least within the FSCs, was to set internal benchmarks. So, we needed to know what the state of uh, the, the practice was. Okay. And uh, we actually use MSS uh, practice observation framework. Uh, we were the first uh, to be trialed by MSF. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a very interesting experience. And you developed by MSF. Sorry? Developed. Yes. Is but trial at the center. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, we use what we learned and we actually applied it within our three centers. Of course, not on such a large scale, but enough for us to get a sensing of uh, what the work was, uh, where the strengths were, and where the gaps uh, are. So, and all this is actually to for us to map out our competency framework and to work with HR on the 
the developmental roadmaps for our staff. Now you can carry on. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> okay, um, like that's it. This year is um, embark on this journey, a five years journey. Uh, and our, we have an aspiration, okay, we wanted to, to be, we want to do good, okay, uh, and uh, as a choice agency, choice employer, choice partner, so this is our aspiration, so this guide us on uh, a little on our work. Of course, to begin with, right, uh, we go down to be very fundamental, uh, basic, the, the factor that makes all things work as the staff, okay, so we look into the continual training, development, uh, qualified marketing staff, as well as the uh, to look into how to uh, how to craft if, uh, if efficient and effective social service. Okay, then in 201, 201 I said there's this clinical development uh, component that has been uh, crafted uh, to look into research, clinical experience, as well as training and professional development. Then of course in 2015 we got our our senior management as well as the uh, board of committee to come in to support the whole. Uh, transformation and that is where we start to look into uh, service governance in terms of human resource. So uh, for example, we make sure that we hire according to uh, to the uh, competency framework. Okay, that is one thing that's what we are very strict uh, strict with. And as well as we look into the service uh, environment. Uh, so earlier on in the dialogue we talk about um, crafting services based on data. So we don't just imagine that services are important to the to the people we serve, but we actually uh, gather data and do some analytics and so on, then then there goes the program that's going to happen. So where are we right now? Um, uh, where are we? So we align the organization and aim to be the best. Um, not arrogant, but it's to remind ourselves that whatever we do, we have to commit to, to serve our best to the people that we, uh, we are living with. Okay? In terms of standards, in terms of your integrity, values, and so on and so forth. And um, we also set uh, comprehensive and clear policies and protocols and procedures. And we have improved structures, systems, and processes. Um, yeah, sorry. And we have uh, we enhanced efficacy and uh, service standards. So, what happened is that uh, according to, to, to my uh, management and board, right, um, the year that we actually implement all this, that um, which is here, okay, with the same uh, staff trend, we are able to manage uh, double the caseload. Okay, that that actually demonstrates the uh, uh, efficacy as well as the efficiency and uh, effectiveness of the uh, whole whole staff I think. Okay, and so what is the impact that comes up comes about all this uh, change? Uh, although we are on the same trajectory, yeah. some po different points. Uh, on your learning curve, uh, they're definitely VCS is definitely further uh, down the road. Uh, for us, uh, where we are, because the initiatives were just rolled out in early 2009, this year, so a lot of the impact is still felt by practitioners. Because uh, if you haven't gotten it, I mean, looking at quality of the work, uh, competency frameworks, uh, training programs, so it's all directly impacting this stuff. Definitely, there are anxieties. Uh, there is unhappiness about the changes, okay. But the same, in the same token, there were people who said, "Hey, you know, this is this is something great. You know, this is something that I would like to uh, help. You, you know, be on board, and uh, you know, the ship has sailed, and, and we, you know, we are on the on this boat. So, you know, we have two sides of the same coin. But I think where change is concerned, um, I think that's not expected." But again, uh, the impact is actually on the teams. But that said, I think I must say that uh, right off the bat, it actually opened up the teams, the three FSCs, to start uh, sharing with one another, to start talking about, uh, to find actually a common language, professional language, to talk about the work. Because different centers have been working in silo for, for so long that when they came together, it was like, you know, this, this, this cousin that you've never met. Uh, it's like, you know, doing a DNA check and then you realize that you have a relative you know, Easter day work you're meeting for the first time. So trying to find a common language uh, is something that's actually quite interesting. 
Um, but at the same time, when people looked at it, it was like, hey, you know, this makes sense. Uh, because this is exactly what I've been seeing on the ground. It's just that as an organization, we are beginning to articulate uh, from a professional framework, uh, what is it that we are actually looking at. And I think um, one of the major, uh, uh, I think, result is that we begin to talk about risk assessment and risk management from a very common uh, language, uh, which is, which is to, to me, is, is actually fantastic. And it also gives senior management the assurance that uh, there are initiatives in place to help workers work uh, confidently, competently, and responsibly. That's, that's the big thing for, for board and senior management. And uh, can I add? Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, just hold on. Don't no worry. Uh, we've also uh, started to see that once we open up the teams, uh, we realize that the like minded people who are actually um, very much want to learn as a team, you know, rather than learn, you know, just within the organization, because you can have inbreeding of knowledge and skills. And when you open up, you start to see the world. MSF, part of the Office of the Director of Social Welfare. So what is it about this practice observation is that it sits within a larger framework that is really about looking at the areas, not just about practice, but practice, governance, as well as service, right? And how can we do better? And it reflects our, our commitment as social workers to this ongoing, to the continual learning, this lifelong learning, and constantly improving ourselves. Yet talked earlier about this spirit of wanting to do better and wanting to, to, do, to, to have a, an excellence in what we do. And that's the whole spirit and the drive behind it. And it's really to look at how we safeguard our clients and our families, making sure that our practice is safe and it's accountable as well, right? And it's professional. And it references a lot of the CSWP, uh, the, the practice frameworks and all that that we do. So for a start, there are three areas that we'll, we are looking at that are uh, part of this whole practice observation, right? And tells the area of the organization, the supervision as well as the casework because we all know that casework practice doesn't happen in its own it doesn't happen in, in, in a bubble it happens within the context of the support from supervision and the larger support from the organization through its supervision structures and case review processes and all that uh, so part of it is really looking at how the SOP governs uh, guides the casework practice and the supervision practice uh, where we'll give feedback as well on some of those things, some of those areas. The other one is to look at the supervision structures and, and part of that whole process also entails things like um, interviews. The principle behind it is this. This is no secret squirrel kind of games, okay? And, and I, I don't know, people might have different, different con conceptions or misconceptions about a ministry coming down to do this. There's no cloak and dagger games around this. It's all about transparency because it's all about how do we do things together, right? And then doing better together. Right, so there's, a, there's, a, there's an idea about that. It's all about open sharing, and there's, there's nothing that, that we, or feedback that we're going to this one will keep for ourselves. We cannot let the agency know. So it'll be very, it'll share very candidly and very openly. Okay, and the measures that we use are very, very objective, and it's all there, and it's the same consistent measures that we use across all the different exercises, across all the different agencies, right? And it's really about the spirit of affirming that ownership and that mutual partnership. So some of the category or types of cases that we're looking at, because this is a little bit more specific to safe practice, right? Uh, it's looking at things like group four cases or cases that present with any of those vulnerability or risk-based kind of elements, whether it's family violence, uh, child protection related stuff, uh, mental health issues and things like that, and how it impacts on the family, and how the workers also uh, can pick up some of these issues. So what do we look at when we, when we are looking at uh, the SOP? It's looking at the structure of supervision, uh, both clinical casework aspects, looking at the case management guidelines that, that covers all those different, different areas to ensure safe practice, right? Including things like collaborative practice, uh, when it comes to the area of assessment in case file review, what do we exactly look at? There are six same areas that we look at in practice observation, just like when we, when we are looking at any other types of case reviews. Okay? So number one is really about the, the contact and the, uh, with the client, especially, and especially with the vulnerable family members. Okay? Uh, so like children, vulnerable adults, uh, very dependent elderly. 
Okay, and also uh, how the workers can identify vulnerability and risk concerns, whether it's clear enough, the identification, the assessment. So a lot of times it's not just being able to identify issues, but how much can we analyze those issues, those risks and the impact that those risks have on the different family members. So those are things that we look at as well, right? And then of course it goes in a sequence, right? After you identify, you assess, and then you intervene around it. Right? What, kind, what are some of the intervention planning and also the safety planning to safeguard some of those identified risk concerns that we have? Uh, and then also how the cases are being evaluated, the case review process, uh, the inputs from supervisors, and of course, lastly, is the collaborative practice. Especially when we're looking at high risk cases and there are other agencies who are involved in the life of that family, collaborative practice is extremely important. And that's one of those other areas that we look at. Okay, so there will be an actual template that we will that we will use to, to, to provide the feedback, areas of good practice noted, areas of improvement, and things like that. And it will be it will be shared, it will be sent to the agencies for you all to note it down as well. And these are very useful because your caseworkers can take it and actually see, hey, what are the areas I need to follow up on, right? And also for discussion with the supervisor during the supervision sessions. And as a center head, you can also have a look at all the different feedback and look at oh, what are some of the other learning needs that my agency might have. Okay. The agency has a very strong supervision structure that really supported, that helped to help the caseworker to be more sensitized to picking up some of the risk areas and things like that. So as you can see, it is very much in line with the whole principle of transparency as well. Okay. But it's not all just about what the FSCs need to do. A lot of times, as we are doing this, this is our first time doing this, right? Uh, so we are also learning a lot from this process. It's, it's, it's a feedback loop as well for us. So looking at some of the things that, uh, that we've learned through the, the pilot last year with five agencies and all that, we understand that the process can be quite stressful for caseworkers, for supervisors, you know, for sector heads having MSF come in and all that. So we are constantly trying to see how can we try and alleviate as much as we can some of these stresses, right? And even the whole process of doing the, the, the practice observation itself uh, and, and the, the forms that we use, the methodologies and all that, whether we actually go in and sit right in the, in the center in one of the interview rooms and then people are outside the door with, what the heck is going on in there, right? Versus like, being put in uh, one of the other multi-purpose rooms away from the FSC, it has different, different implications. So we were also very mindful about some of these things because suddenly like when well, MSF gets ushered like secretly into this other room where nobody knows what goes on in there. So those are a lot of our learnings as well that we, when we went through this, right? And, and how do we do this in a way that doesn't cause as much as we can, it uh, doesn't stress people out. That people are very clear that oh, this is what they are all. Of, this is what MSF is doing, as well, right? So, so that was one of the reflection there, and also um, we also had questions like this when when after we provided the feedback, then we also received uh, feedback from the agencies. And actually, I checked back with my worker, and my worker said actually this was done there, uh, but it just wasn't like maybe perhaps not very clearly recorded or something like that. So part of that reflection for us is, is this something that uh, we can also include in our future processes, whether we also might, during that open feedback session, we might also uh, want to clarify with the caseworker directly as well as with the supervisor. But then again, it also depends on how comfortable the caseworkers are, like, suddenly have to sit there and are fronted by like a whole panel of people. So, so that, that's something that we'll continue to see um, and, and work with the different agencies as well, how we can do that best, right? And the other thing is that the whole practice observation is not just about what the FSEs do, but also or where are some of the learning areas or learning gaps. But it's also where are some of the gaps that happen in MSF side or with the systems part. So part of the whole practice observation uh, that we do also looks at some of the other systems related challenges that we face in, in, the, in the carrying out or in the managing of that particular family, right? So if there are cases where it's, uh, it's been handled by CPS before in the past, Child Protective Service, and there were certain things, there were feedback given, we actually would go back and address some of those issues with CPS. If it's to do with APS or any other systems, that's what we will try and address as well. Not just between the MSF and FSC level, but also internally as a, as a ministry across different divisions, 
and also across other systems as well. So um, the sharing by the embassies. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about our experience, our experience of going through the observation. Um, we're going to share on behalf of the five agencies. My name is Kaniga, I'm from Sinda FSC, um, Nathan Natalie from Amukyo FSC, and Dorothy from Samu Moral will also be sharing with you. Every organization, right, has this, this core belief on how you go about when something like this happens, right? When the governing body, per se, right, MSF comes in. So what is it that you still hold true to? And what we found was there was a line and there were these philosoph guiding philosophies that actually ran through all the organizations. And later when we were sharing it with MSF, we actually realized there were a lot of similarities with what they were coming with. Things like transparency and integrity. So the first one was integrity and accountability. Reflect the work done. I know the idea might be that when someone's coming to check your work, you give your best face, right? You put on all your makeup, you make sure your hair is done right, you make sure your files are very pretty, right? Everything is in there. And the truth is, all the organizations that, all the agencies that had the practice observation has done their work. Everyone knows what they're doing and everyone is a professional. So there is no reason to do anything other than show the work that you have done. So that's where the integrity comes along. And the accountability. At the end of the day, we are not doing the work for ourselves. We're doing the work for our clients, which means there has to be accountability for the work that you're doing. And what we realized was the important point was to reflect the work you've done. There's no point going in and manicuring your files, going in to add things that don't exist. However, when you look back at the file, like Paula said, sometimes the work that's done may not have been documented, or the document might not be in the file. You know and we all know that sometimes that happens. Some things are uploaded, some things are not uploaded along the way, because SSNet is SSNet. Mm -hmm. However, at the end of the day, the files that went out were the files for the work that we did. And that was something that we helped through throughout all of us. <coughs> the spirit of learning, an opportunity to see a different perspective. I think this was something that was very, very hard to put in our heads in the first when you first hear the news, right? It's really like breaking of bad news, right? Let's be honest. <laughs> right? And then you tell yourself, no, let's go in with the spirit of learning. That's what we want to do. But at the end of the day, that is what it was. It wasn't about coming in to tell you what you did right and what you did wrong, because that's how you should do it, but to work together to see what would be another way to look at things. And I think that's one of the biggest takebacks we had as well. We found out that it wasn't about what we had missed out, it was about how we could have looked at something more in a way that we are not used to, right? And I think that spirit of learning, an opportunity to look at things from a different perspective, because when you are in the community, you're always looking at it from the perspective of a community. You're not looking at it as a more holistic perspective sometimes, and sometimes you are. And when it's reflected back to you that you did do it, hey, that's great as well. Team welfare. The stresses are there. The truth is, in every team, some people get more stressed, some people get less stressed. Sometimes it's your head who's more stressed, sometimes it's <laughs> your staff who's more stressed. It depends. But at the end of the day, you look out for everyone in your team. Because this is not about the individual. It's not about the work of the individual. It's about the whole agency, it's about the organization, it's about the community. So when someone finds that this idea of practice observation is very stressful, you look out for each other and you hold together and you make sure the team gets through it. And finally, transparency, communication of expectations. I think there are two levels of this. One thing that came quite clearly was MSF told us what is coming up, right? And it's very important for this to cascade down. The management needs to tell the staff. The staff needs to make sure that everyone is aligned with the idea of what is going to happen. And at the same time, the communication within the ranks. Because sometimes when you don't have a clear idea of what is happening, that's where the trouble is. That's where you get a bit lost. And we thought that these were the four things that really helped all the organizations, all the agencies 
to go through this audit with a little bit more lightness and with the right idea of what the practice observation was about. So in preparation of the practice observation, um, we're looking at it from a few levels. Review and update of SOPs. The truth is, we all do our work, right? And a lot of the way, CSWP came along, right? And when CSWP came along, we really aligned ourselves to the CSWP. But did our SOPs catch up? Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. Does everyone in the organization know what the SOPs are? You might be doing all the work, right? But it might not be completely captured in your SOP. So one thing that happened, and we are given the um, time to do this, to make sure you go back to your SOPs, to make sure you have done everything, and everything is documented. Uh, documented. The thing about the SOP is it's a document. It is not the work we do. However, it guides the work we do. So to review and update the SOPs. On the level of the FSC team, I think of everything here, most important is the agency briefing on purpose and process of the practice observation. Because this is what allays fears. Because when you come into a practice observation, the idea of, again, someone external from your agency stepping into your agency can be a bit scary. But to understand that the purpose is to learn. The purpose is to work together and do things in a way that is more helpful for your agency and at the end of the day, helpful for your client. I think this is a very important portion of um, the work that needs to be done. So the entire organization needs to plan to have a briefing to make sure that everyone from the top management to your supervisors to your staff knows what's going on. Um, the case identifications. The case identification is based on those six areas, as well as certain things like vulnerability, the vulnerables, um, high risk, clientele, and to look at that, right? Case identification. I myself identified profiles. So the profiles they gave us were um, those with FB in the family, those with vulnerables, those with elderly. So the profile will be given to you. Um, depends on the fast rating, so we are looking at the level 4 cases as well as within the internal supervision done. So it's not like this, I come, I pick up 6 of your cases which are level 4 and you don't know which cases they are. It doesn't work that way. What happens is you are told this is the profile of cases we'll be looking at. So the agency looks at this profile, pulls out the cases like that and you talk to your supervisor. Right? You say, I have these cases, which of those do you think we can look at? And then every um, the supervisors would have their cases as well because you have the high risk cases, so usually supervisors carry a lot of cases. So all this is done to choose the cases that will be put up before the six are chosen from them. So this is the biggest layer of the work that's done. Guidelines for review. What's helpful is for the entire organization to have a guideline of what you're going to look at. You know the six areas that we talked about. So to ensure that all the paper, all the documentation is inside. Again, we do the work, but sometimes there's nothing to tell you that the work was done because it's inside the worker's head, it's inside the client's heart, but it is not in the paper, right? So this is where the guidelines for review should be there. Make sure that areas that are being looked for are in the files. You are given time to do it, put it in. Sometimes um, it can be done on the SSNet itself, right? That's what I understand. It can be paper files or it can be done on the SSNet. Whatever needs to be there, you have the time to do it. Okay, organizational assurance. I think the management has its part, the staff have their part, but also the management can knowing that the stresses will be there on the staff, right? And the staff work that's going to be done to leverage on other portions of the organization to support the team. So leveraging on administrative support. For example, certain documents, right, you need to start uploading. Certain documents you need to um, change, say you have to change your case file because the case files are tearing apart. Your social workers, your supervisors are already running around. So to be able to leverage on administrative support, I understand some organizations get their admin officers 
to start uploading everything. This is really helpful because it takes the pressure off the team. If you have the luxury, if they can be running some of the programs that um, the staff are running, it would be helpful as well. <laughs> Protected time. This is very important because when you are looking at these uh, the components that you need to look at for the files, to have the protected time. The protected time in every organization runs differently. Some it can be within the supervisory group. So my, with my supervisors, I decide this half of the day I'll be looking at the files. It could be across the board. Okay, these two days, you all will have protected time across um, all the workers. So it depends on what works best for your organization. But to be in that mindset, to look at your files, to look at your documentation, it's helpful. As we, are, as we are hearing about what is actual, the actual experience that goes on for the different level of staff, you know, then we have a special guest, which is a staff of four years running, four good years in the FSC, and then practice observation keep her. So let's welcome Dorothy. Um, so something that I appreciated was that it was more consultative because, mm -hmm. I mean, like Kanika said, we do our best in our work, but here and there, sometimes we might miss out certain things, or perhaps it's just not clearly articulated enough. So that was where it was quite helpful. They would check with us. So it wasn't like, hey, why is this missing? It was more like, oh, uh, can you share with us or elaborate a bit more about this? Or what was the rationale that we decided to do this? Has it been checking with your supervisor? Mm -hmm. So it strengthened our practice at also different levels. So including these documents, not just in the case file, but also in terms of our documentation for supervision as well. I think if only when we authentically look at it as something to learn from, our supervisors will also look at it as something to learn from. And I think also to communication was very important. To communicate what came from the management to the staff and communicate what comes from the staff back to the management mm -hmm. is very important because at the end of the day, if there is a breakdown in the communication, it will be harder on everyone and the work doesn't get done. Mm. I think another thing that we also learned is um, through the pro uh, process of the audit as well is how we look at supervision as well. I think we always talk about the risk lens, right, which was one of the lessons. So even in the process of supervision, to really look at cases differently mm -hmm. and look at the work with the supervisee differently and the collaboration aspect, I think that was something that we really learned mm -hmm. during this process. It's like, you know, I think we enter it with the spirit of collaboration. And with a pilot, you need people to pilot. Yeah, or you need agencies who are going to be on board of this pilot. And I think being on the pilot, uh, how we approach it, it also gives us, you know, an advantage of, you know, we also don't know what's going to happen. And they also don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, so we may also try to figure out along with them as well as, you know, maybe have it easier. Yeah, so that is the token of how some of us, you know, are motivated to pilot. And I think true and behold, this is a learning process. And I want to emphasize that the important role of the center here is also to be an advocate. Yeah, to give really genuine and even sometimes very honest feedback to also the MSF team. Of course, bear in mind that you know we are very kind and gentle to our pregnant lady here. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we really tell them what are our struggles on the ground, resourcing as well as what makes and what kind of preparations and the intensity that we take to prepare for this. So uh, moving forward, so these are some of the key takeaways that all of the five MSCs found was in common. So I think it has been brought up multiple times that it's more about safe practice. So keeping really the vulnerable, so actually all family members safe. And it's really to enhance how we look at the family. What are certain areas that we can really strengthen the way we care for them. And also, yeah, actually we have always been caring for them. It's just how we articulate it in terms of our documentation. It's like um, the kind of interaction we have with our family, the, their physical state even small little things that perhaps could be very vital in such situations. Okay, so one of the first questions we have as a sector in FST is what are the challenges that we face today in deepening <coughs> capabilities in our FSC? Yeah, and what are some of the suggestions that we have? In terms of collaboration, right? Here we are talking a lot about collaboration meeting one another. But somehow when we come from this kind of platform where we really get to see another person, 
Uh, uh, either it's very big, something like this, or something very small. I mean, like at the MSF and the rooftop, but it's very short. So, and then there are a lot of agendas moving on. So, sometimes you don't have time to really get to know the person. There's, there, there's not much of a like, cross center, small scale, smaller scale sort of initiative being driven. Then, having said that, another, time, another uh, opportunity would be like, uh, uh, people that come from this kind of gathering. Usually, have the same few people. <coughs> yeah, so somehow we don't really get to see uh, faces. faces. Yeah, many times it's just through names, through emails. Yeah, mm. so maybe more of uh, more intimate kind of setting. It can be in the form of smaller scale initiative, mm. or it can be even like sisters uh, centers. I mean, centers in the same town. Where same cluster. Uh, yeah. yeah, then we come together and we start. Mm. Yeah, okay. like maybe even for more formal things like. The bowling, games, things like that. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, a meeting with less agenda, right? Yes, so yeah. that we can deepen our conversation. Correct. Okay. Just a. Uh, I want yes. to comment on this. <laughs> sure. I think one of the challenges that we face in really deepening competency is really uh, another perspective. Because I think currently still a lot of agencies working amongst their agency. I know they have a lot of talents, they have a lot of experience within an agency. But some an external point of view would really be helpful. And I think this practice observation honestly was really a lot sent to us in the sense that it allowed a different perspective. Uh, I think the other challenge that we find is really this evaluative literacy. You know, as we talk about practice standards, as we talk about quality of practice, how do we then evaluate practice, you know, according to what standards and all, which I think uh, maybe in our business in operations, it's very hard to really keep an eye on it. And the other one is how much do we know and maybe some benchmarking from the ministry. I uh, mean, since you all have access to a lot more data than we have, uh, I thought that would be something that could help us to identify some of our learning points. Uh, where can we improve further? Okay. Just to move on to the next one, what are some specific initiatives that we can together as a sector think about that could we as a sector implement in the next five years to deepen capabilities it's really one major feedback that comes up you know to, to look at practice observations and i think we also have our own protests that shouldn't be only done through documentation mm. yeah. okay. and we also believe that you know even in documentation uh, it may be a very good piece of work yeah, but then it may not really necessarily reflect practice. Yeah, I think it is a, a lot of us debate goes on, and at this point of time, what then the, the the consensus that let's say we have is also there are also limitations that currently our needs is through documentation. Sadly, also, but I think it's a hope for the sector that we can evolve this practice. Yeah, and even train our worker to be able to then share their case and to present their assessment in a very professional confidence way yeah, so that they can articulate as well as they can even show their practice hopefully to other means. Yeah, but I think recognizing that it's effort from the sector that we have to you know evolve or shift towards that and also maybe in response to the capability um, really recognizing that every agency has you know their, their areas of strength and if we look at competency of what it needs to be a very you know, good uh, social worker in the FSC, actually it don't, there doesn't differ from one agency to another. Yeah. So because now currently I would also have to acknowledge that our training is very much in-house based. We train it within the agency to equip the staff to be able to do the role. But I'm at the same time very, very curious. What are the other agencies doing in their in-house training? Are there ways that we can synchronize all this into a very much coherent curriculum? Because even when workers move from one FSC to another FSC, they are still delivering that piece of work and needing that same um, competency necessary. Yeah. So some some consolidation, perhaps. I'm not sure. How do you think we should all get ready? And what are the changes? Uh, or the changes that we need to make to implement this initiative. I think we hear that there's so many things that we're going to do, right? A lot of integration that's going to happen, a lot of collaboration. Collaboration takes time and all that. But today, uh, even as we're sitting here, we have organization of different sizes. Those who only have one versus those that are three and four. I think it's different. Uh, but then, as a sector, how do you think what would be some of the major things that we want to prepare ourselves to get ready for 
whatever is coming forth. I mean, I just hear all this uh, sharing. It's just stimulating my mind. I was thinking, I, 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 we, we run just one FSC. A lot of time I feel that for a uh, worker in uh, one FSC, um, no matter how much we want to learn, right, there is certain kind of like limit. So I think um, tapping into what we have just mentioned about looking at the FSC sector as a whole instead of just an organization, just an individual organization. So I was thinking is like, would there be values of a more cross learning? Say for example, if um, <coughs> the FSC worker of one organization actually have a chance also to discuss case or see how other people look at cases from another FSC, maybe there's also another avenue for learning. Yeah. Um, this whole idea about uh, practice uh, observation and looking at how to build capability. I mean, as a worker, I think generally the response is like once we look at practice observation, the, um, this whole light bulb about scrutiny, scrutinizing my work comes very prominent. Yeah, rather than you are um, helping me to learn. You get I me? Mean? Although maybe the intention behind is for learning, but I think as a practitioner or as a, as a um, management of organization, definitely we concerned about um, is there a so-called ranking again, ABCD, you know, one, two, three, four, that kind of thing. So I, I was thinking, if we really want to build the capability in the long run and looking at how to raise the standard in the long run, we must give time. We must be willing to give time to workers and for the organization to grow and to develop, yeah? And especially helping those smaller organizations like us, how will the worker view that they continue to learn? Not just within their own organization, but they're able to see that, hey, how other people learn, and then they feel inspired to learn, and stay with the organization, you know? Because sometimes it's like, the fear is like, when they learn too much, okay, they see that, hey, other, the, the greener pasture is somewhere else, that kind of thing, yeah? So, so I think, it's like how to strike some balance. Yeah, so we're looking at this whole ecosystem that is not just um, competing, but it's really is like leveling up that everybody grow together, right? Is is everyone she has the own uniqueness to contribute to the sector. What are the things that we will do um, upcoming meetings? I was saying that we will be having the second round pilot practice observation. Um, is that we will also be deploying the master practice leaders uh, to those agencies who feel that they would like to have that time uh, to prepare to be practice observed. <laughs> yeah, so that's one of the things that we are doing. Uh, we have also, Paulus and I have also reviewed the training materials for the, what do you call it now, casework what? The family-based uh, casework training for FSC. Yeah, so the current onboarding has been renamed to the casework. <laughs> <laughs> Family-based casework training for FSCs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're making it very, very practice-based as well. And uh, we've also developed it to be very much aligned to the practice observations and the areas of practice that we're looking at. The other thing that we're also looking at, uh, in line with what Sarah was saying about cross-learning, uh, we're also going to develop more uh, learning journeys, attachment opportunities as well. So learning journeys will be uh, things where we will try and arrange for visits, uh, journeys to various establishments which you will kind of benefit from, like maybe prisons, family courts, um, crisis shelters and so on. I mean, we haven't worked out <laughs> the details yet, but that's one of the plans we have. The other kind of thing we're going to have is even attachments. Attachments to the protection services, attachments to commit facilities, um, to enable learning, to enable cross-sector learning. Uh, to be exposed to a risk-based kind of training and so on. So, just now I think one of the questions also, so what, why the focus on risk? I think the reason for that is because that's where life and death issues happen. Mm -hmm. um, where we can be certain that cases with risk issues are being managed well, we're kind of certain that there's other type of cases can be managed very well as well. And that's, that's our ideology behind that. Huh? Uh, oh, oh yes, so the other thing is, I, I have external memory drives so also. Uh, the other thing that we're going to do as well, I think you guys have also received invitations, will be practice circles. That's the other area in which we want to enhance learning. Because we, we recognize that through research, training in itself is not enough. 
is never enough. So we want to see how it can be translated through small group discussions, which is, I think, one of the questions that you guys uh, you asked uh, about how we can come in smaller groups, discuss issues around practice. So one of the invites that have come out like a few weeks ago was on practice circles around supervision for risk lens. I'm very happy to see 20 people coming forward to say, yes, yes, we want that. Um, we are looking at developing other practice circles as well on other topics, um, maybe around suicide, maybe around mental health, uh, maybe around even supervision in general. Uh, the other one is risk management is the other practice circles we are looking at.